Well, good morning. For our time in Lent, we are going through the book of Esther. And Esther is a lot of fun because one minute it kind of reads like an episode of The Bachelor, and then the next minute it reads like your favorite spy novel. Last week we saw that Esther is chosen because of her great beauty and to be part of a, a contest to be the next queen of Persia. She and her relative, Mordecai, they hatch a plan to make it happen, and it did. Esther, the orphan slave girl, becomes queen of Persia. Chapter two says, then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. But what the king does not know and what the reader does know, what you and I know, is that Esther is actually Jewish. We also learned that it was her own adopted father who told her not to reveal her heritage to the Persians. And verse 20 repeats it one more time. Esther had not made known her kindred or her people, as Mordecai had commanded her, for Esther obeyed Mordecai just as when she was brought up by him. So our story continues. There's a great wedding feast. Esther's adopted father is hanging out by the castle gate, as you do, and he overhears a plot to assassinate the king. It says, in those days, as Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, who guarded the threshold, became angry and sought to lay hands on King Xerxes. And this came to the knowledge of Mordecai, and he told it to Queen Esther. And Esther told the king in the name of Mordecai. When the affair was investigated and found to be so, the men were both hanged on the gallows, and it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles in the presence of the king. So Mordecai is hanging out by the gate, and he overhears a coup. They're going to kill the king. So he tells Esther, Esther tells the king, the king looks into it, turns out it's actually true, they arrest the conspirators, crisis is abated. Well done, Mordecai, right? Pat on the back. And you know, historically, it's a pretty good deal to help a king like this. Kings are usually pretty good at rewarding people who are loyal. So the reader is now kind of waiting to see what good fortune befalls Mordecai. Chapter three begins, after these things, King Xerxes promoted Haman, the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, and advanced him and set his throne above all the officials who were with him. What? Who is Haman? And why did he get Mordecai's promotion? <sighs> this, this always happens, doesn't it? Mordecai, who deserves the promotion, he gets passed over by an Agagite. Life isn't fair, is it? In the days that follow, Haman is out on the town and enjoying his new promotion and his regal stature, and he passes by all the common folk. Everyone who sees him, they bow down in respect. That is, everyone except Mordecai. Verse 3 says, When the king's servants, who were at the king's gate, said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman, in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. His friends go back to him and say, hey, Mordecai, don't rock the boat. Just, just do what everybody else is doing. You're, you are going to get everyone into so much trouble. But as a Jew, Mordecai cannot bow to another person. That would be disrespect to his faith. And so the book of Esther becomes a book that asks, how will we keep our faith in God while trying to be successful in a culture that doesn't share our beliefs? That is what the book of Esther is all about. How does someone maintain their faith living in a culture that doesn't worship God? Eventually the king's servants, they give up trying to reason with Mordecai. And so they go to Haman and they try to offer Haman the same excuse Mordecai gave them. They said, hey, can you pardon Mordecai because, you know, he's a Jew. Who knows? Maybe Haman will understand. 
What do you think? Do you think that excuse is going to work? <laughs> Verse 5 says, And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was filled with fury. So, yeah, it didn't work. And you'd think that a normal person, having been hurt or wronged, would then seek revenge on that person, right? Tear down the person that wronged you, not Haman. Verse 6 says, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai, throughout the whole kingdom. Wow. Did you read this? You read the same thing as me, right? We read the same thing. Because of one man's accusations, Haman now blames all Jewish people. Can you imagine if the president of your country was driving in a limo and he saw a man holding a sign that says, I don't agree with your foreign policy, but instead of, you know, pulling over and asking the man politely to stop or maybe taking away a sign or putting him in jail, what that leader does is he gathers up every single person from that man's ethnicity and puts them all onto an island and then drills that island with bombs. That's over the top, right? That, that's not just over the top, it's insane. This is how the villain in the story of Esther thinks. And right now, Haman is the second most powerful man in Esther's world. So Haman goes to the king and he says, hey, there's a certain group of people who they don't keep all your laws and they kind of march to the beat of their own drum, and if it's okay with you, I would like to destroy them all. And I'm not really paraphrasing too much. That's pretty much what he asks. He never tells Xerxes that he's talking about the Jews. He calls the people worthless. He tells the king, you won't miss them. He doesn't offer a shred of evidence. There's no support. And he says, you know, it's all, it's all true. Which it's not. Right now, the truth is, in Xerxes' world, the wife whom he loves is Jewish. The man who uncovered the plot of his assassination was Jewish. But Xerxes doesn't care. He doesn't ask for proof. He doesn't ask for any more details. Doesn't say, who are these people? No. Verse 8 says all we need to know. They do not keep the king's laws so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. And what do we know about Xerxes? He is a man of image, of self. His only concern is the wars he wins, the precious stones in his castle, and the beautiful wife that sits on his arm. And so, if his second in charge says there's a group of people who are getting in the way of all of that, then they need to go. Xerxes gives Haman the ring off his finger, and he says, do whatever you need to do. Verse 13 says, letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, to annihilate all Jews, young and old, women and children. In one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Can you imagine living in Persia and then receiving this notification? To know that if one person from your race messes up, disrespects someone, it costs everyone their life. It costs you your life, your family. To know that the people who are in charge, the people who are in power, they care so much about their own wealth and maintaining their own image that they're willing to commit mass genocide just to keep it. Last week, I bet we all thought, ah, that King Xerxes, he's pretty shallow, <laughs> right? Holding a beauty contest to pick his next wife. That's all he wants, just the most beautiful wife. What about now? I mean, Haman is, Haman is evil, but Xerxes is no better. I bet if we were king, we would never commit mass genocide, right? We'd certainly never listen to an evil man like Haman. We wouldn't give our ring and our consent 
for whatever he wanted? No, if I were king, I would rule with justice. I would listen to my people. I would let them know that they could trust me. I certainly wouldn't give my power and my authority away to somebody who could abuse it. Last week, we also said that the world Esther lives in is pretty messed up. And then one more chapter in, things are worse. Can you imagine living in a world where these two men are in charge of whether you live or die? And where is God in all of this? Again, there's our question, where is God? I mean, if, well, okay, look, if you were gonna write a story about the history of the United States and you were gonna mention the Revolutionary War and the Constitutional Convention and the first federal government, would you feel that you were doing a good job if you told that story and never once mentioned George Washington? His name's not there. No, that would, that would be inconceivable, right? So it can't go unnoticed that in the book of Esther, God, who should be central to the story, is never mentioned. It's true, God is never mentioned by name in the book of Esther. There are some scholars who even question why Esther is even in the Bible. I mean, Esther just seems to get by on her looks. Xerxes is a power-hungry, drunk and womanizer. Mordecai is insolent and he is a rebel. And Haman is a maniac who's bent on revenge. So let me tell you why Esther is in the Bible. Because it's a story about providence. The book conceals the name of God as a deliberate literary strategy in order to reveal God's providential actions. Simply by removing God's name, it actually makes him stick out all the more. You know what providence is? Providence means that God is lovingly guiding all of history, all for his good purposes and intentions. And providence refers to the way God works behind the scenes in all of our lives. He's orchestrating everything according to his good purpose. And true, there's no, there's no obvious miracles in providence. Rather, the things that happen just appear to be normal human events. But in truth, they are all under God's sovereign control. What appears to be an amazing coincidence is not a coincidence. It's divine. It's design. I mean, think about all the amazing coincidences we've seen so far in the book of Esther, right? Without Vashti refusing to come, then there would be no reason to have a new queen. And then when going to select a new queen, a Hebrew slave girl is called to the palace. Never, right? Never in a million years. Even more so, that girl wins the, the king's heart and becomes queen. What? And then it's that same girl's adopted father who learns the king is going to be assassinated. That's an amazing coincidence. And on the surface, then, the book of Esther seems to be a story about how the Jewish people had adopted Persian culture. They didn't return with the other Jews to the Promised Land. They stayed in Persia. Perhaps they had forgotten their God. They even forgot to put his name in the story. But there's a message that's just beneath the surface of this book. And that is when Israel forgot God, God did not forget Israel. So, as a literary device, God is deliberately left out of the story to reflect the way the Jewish people had left him out of their lives. But, as will unfold in the rest of the story, we're going to see that God never forgets his promises never forgets his people. God is actively working in all of their lives, even when we don't see him, even when we don't ask him. Let me show you the verse, okay? This is the verse that turns the whole story. King Xerxes takes the ring off his finger, he gives it to Haman, and he says, the money is given to you, the people also, to do with them as it seems good to you. The king gives the Jewish people over to Haman. And he says, do whatever you see fit. 
But here's the problem. The Jewish people are not his to give. There is an unnamed, unseen hero in this story. And right now, our two villains at the end of chapter three, they are clinking their glasses together and enjoying a, a drink out on the rooftop. And they, they say, you know what? Our, our plan is foolproof. They're laughing at all their evil schemes. But they have underestimated the real hero of this story and that he is actually in control. Even if we don't see him, the story is about to take a turn. Esther became queen. Xerxes threw a dinner party for her, and it felt like life's getting better. Things are looking up, right? Life's improving. And then, right? Out of nowhere, some overwhelming thing lands in your lap. Life just sharply goes to the left. That's how it, that's what happens. Life is going fine maybe even better than fine, and then fired from your job, heart attack, stroke, cancer, all Fs on the report card, jail, car accident, death. I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what's overwhelming you. But when we read Esther chapter three, we can see that even when we don't see God, he is still the hero of our lives. Even if you can't see him or hear him or read his name, he has a plan. And if you trust him, he will save you. Last week we said that you have a king that is greater than Xerxes. There is a greater king in the story of Esther and it's actually his empire that we all live in. And when we are in his presence, he is worthy to worship. His laws are true and just, but you also have an enemy who is greater than Haman. And the Bible calls this enemy the accuser because what the accuser does is he lies to you. He convinces you to rebel, convinces you to commit treason. And then when you disobey, this same accuser stands before God and accuses you, tells God that you messed up and reminds God that the punishment, your punishment, is death. First Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You mess up, and then Satan goes to the king and said, hey, there's this uh, certain group of people who don't keep all your laws, and they kind of march to the beat of their own drum, and if it's okay with you, I would like to destroy them all. But God says, no, they're not your people. So you don't get to touch them. See, when Esther chapter four begins, Susa is in an uprising. The people are distraught. Mordecai goes to the castle gates and he tears his clothes and Esther has no idea what's going on. Verse 4 says, when Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to a tender, and ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what this was and why it was. See, palace life had kept her isolated. So she sends Mordecai new clothes. She says, oh, well, he, he needs new clothes. I can fix this. Here's new clothes. Instead, Mordecai tells Esther's servant exactly what's going on. And he says, I need you to change the king's mind. And this next part is very crucial to the story. Chapter 4, verse 11 says, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, Esther says, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come to the king these 30 days. This is, this is Esther's dilemma. And it's ironic, 
right? It is ironic. Do you see the irony here? Because Mordecai has been telling Esther all this time to hide her identity so that she would live. And now he says, I need you to reveal your identity so that the people will live. But Esther says, yeah, but that means I could die. All this time, you've been trying to save me by preventing me from telling the king who I really am in order to save me. But now you're saying that I should reveal my identity, but I could die. Mordecai has been trying to keep Esther alive. But now he's at the end of his rope. There's no plan left. There's, there's no scheme. This is a Hail Mary. This is, this is it. We got no other choice. Now it's bigger than Esther. It's bigger than Mordecai. We've got we've to keep the people alive. I got one shot. Esther is my one shot. After all, the king loves her. And Esther says, eh, I don't know about that. Actually, I haven't seen the guy in a month. Remember, Xerxes has a harem. You think the king sleeps alone? Esther says, I don't know if I'm as influential as you think. And I think now, in this moment, Mordecai realizes that the road ahead is now out of his control. Have you ever come to the end of the rope and realized there's no more rope? That you can't fix things? The life is just broken. You look around and you feel like the enemy is winning. Or the people around you are hurting. And there's no plan that you can make. Nothing you can do can fix what is coming. That place where you are, it's actually the best place to be because then it becomes fertile soil. And that's where God does his best work. I said before that God is not in this book, but I want to show you one place where he may just appear. In verse 13, Mordecai says, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will find escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. Now, Mordecai seems strangely confident. And he says, you know, even if deliverance doesn't come from you, it'll come from somewhere. And I think that's the tide that turns for Mordecai. He's admitting that he is weak, and he is seeing the futility in all his plans so far. And in this moment, he's laying it all down at God's feet. And that is what faith looks like. Right now, Mordecai, he doesn't know what God's going to do. He doesn't know what deliverance is going to look like. So rather than worry and spin his wheels with another plan, Mordecai just says, you know what? I give up control. I give up control. In this story, it's God, not empire, that will have the last word. And so he says one last thing to Esther. He says, who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mordecai tells Esther, don't sell yourself short. Maybe providence has put you here. Maybe this is why you're queen. Maybe this is why all of these things have been happening to you. God's name may not be in this book, but Mordecai seems to be telling her that her role in this story is not over. God is not done with her. Even though she may not be close to God right now, he hasn't abandoned her. He hasn't stopped pursuing her. And if she would have faith, God can still use her. And it works. It worked. Verse 15 says, Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. 
I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Notice that Mordecai and Esther, their previous plan, how they had left God out of the problem, they had solved Esther's problem by concealing their faith. They said, you know what, just adopt palace lifestyle, keep your head down, don't raise, don't raise any suspicion. Now Esther says that she and her servants will fast, which means she's going to leave it in God's hands. Instead of looking her best, she's going to look to God for direction. And she knows that her actions could mean her death. And so she is now counting on God to show up. She is counting on grace. And let me tell you something. This morning, our situation is no different than the Jews in this story. Each one of us have offended a king far greater than Xerxes. Each one of us has been selfish and tried to dethrone this king, to take his power, to run our own lives. And the law says that the punishment for that sin, that treason, is death. Romans 6 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it's a problem and we can't fix it. There's no amount of work, no amount of scheming on our part is enough. Instead, each one of us has to, like Mordecai, tear our garment, confess, walk to the temple gate, and beg for mediation. We need someone like Esther who can go to the king on our behalf. We need someone who's going to plead with him. And in order for that to happen, we need a mediator who is like us, a mediator who knows what it's like to be human. But even more than that, we need a mediator who is sympathetic and who can find a reason to pardon us. Titus 3 says he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. That is what we all need to be saved not because of any work or effort done by us, but solely by the work of our mediator, the only one who is allowed into his perfect presence. First Timothy says, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. In Jesus, you have a better mediator than Esther. Jesus, Jesus also spent quiet time in prayer before it was his turn to stand before God. But he didn't bring the king a meal. He didn't bring good looks. Instead, he brought his flesh and blood and he offered it up as a sacrifice for your freedom. Esther risked her life to save her people. But Jesus gives his life to save the world. You and I, we live in a broken world. More so than Esther's. There are hundreds of new, heartbreaking things every single day. But you have Jesus. And you can take the broken things of this world and you can go to him for help. We no longer have anything to fear. There is no need to tremble. There is no need to worry. There is no need to have sleepless nights. There's no reason for scheming or plans. And there's certainly no reason to go it alone. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. We have Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we forget. We receive the news that our world is broken, that there are enemies that wish to destroy us. 
We look ahead and we see that life isn't going the way we expected. It's worse. Each new day, there is heartbreaking news in the lives of our friends and in our own life, in our world. We see corrupt world, corrupt leadership, sin everywhere. And it'd be easy for us to grab a shovel and just dig and try to find a way out, to try to hatch a plan, to scheme, to try to solve it on our own. You gave us this beautiful gift called freedom. And so we want to use our freedom to solve our problems. It is so incredibly difficult for us to release our freedom and to trust and to rely on you. To give up all our plans, to lay down all of our tools and just to worship you because you save. You have a plan to save each one. You have a plan to save the world. You have a plan to rescue each one of your children. And it is perfect because your son was perfect. Lord Jesus, be the mediator of my life. Thank you for throwing your life at the feet of the King for my sake. It was your blood, it was your flesh that took away God's wrath and gave me new clothes. I am forever in debt. May I turn to you each day with each new struggle, with each new heartbreak, with each new problem. Help me not to worry. Help me to take the path ahead knowing that you are in charge, that your sovereign grace is in control of all things, that heaven and earth are yours that your people are yours, that I am yours. Help me not to worry. Help me to trust. I have a beautiful mediator, and his name is Jesus. Amen. You have Jesus. I'll see you next week.